Did you know that the sunlight, the energy coming from the sunlight onto the Earth, is almost 3,000 times the amount of energy that we need to sustain our daily activities? And that makes the sun our most abundant renewable energy source, much more so than uh, the other renewable energy sources. And that's important to know, because with climate change and pollution going on, we need to invest in renewables as good as we can. And one major advantage of solar energy is its decentralized character. Power can be delivered directly to the individual. So by show of hands, how many of you have solar panels on their roofs? Wow, that's impressive. And, and how many of you would really like to get them once the opportunity presents itself? Wow, that, I'm impressed, I'm really impressed. That's absolutely the spirit, because if we go on like this, at some point, we will get there that the total, the cumulative amount or area of solar panels in the world equals the area of the country of Spain. And at that point, we would be fully self-sufficient on solar power alone. Or I'll even, even trump that. I bet you didn't know that given current technology, but also limitations in the use of space and all, that we could safely power the world three times. Well, if that's not encouraging, then I don't know what is. Of course, in all of this, the central part, the central role, is played by the technology. What type of materials are we using to convert sunlight into electricity? I'm sure you're all familiar with these, apparently, you have to. These are silicon solar cells, and they make up 92 to 93% of all installed solar panels in the world. And that includes the one I had on my head 20 years ago, or a little bit more, uh, to power the little fan to keep me cool during the summer. Safe to say, of course, that already at a very young age, I, I saw the potential of this technology, <laughs> of course. No, seriously, photovoltaics has become booming business, but predominantly in the last decade, mostly due to a reduction in price points, but there has been an increase of a uh, factor of 30. And for most of this increase, we have silicon technology to thank. Well, that's great, isn't it? It's established technology, people are buying it everywhere, it works fine, that's absolutely fantastic. It would be almost sacrilege to think that maybe out there there could be an alternative. No, no, no. Why, why would we change a winning team? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to go into that discussion, not going to do that. Instead, let me take you onto a journey to a much smaller scale, the scale of atoms and molecules. And an analogy that I really like to make is that chemistry and material science is like Lego for adults, or for advanced people, if you will. <laughs> Every, everything we are, our whole lives, everything we touch, we use, is basically us grabbing from this box. We can combine bricks to make composite bricks and design materials, but in the end, no matter how you look at it, Every tangible aspect of our lives boils down to us grabbing in this box. And that's also how it happened in New Jersey at Bell Labs in the 1950s. They were avid Lego builders. They were playing around with silicon. And at some point, they had a piece of silicon, they put electrodes on top, they held it into the light, and they discovered that the silicon could capture the light and convert it into electricity. That was new, that was new. And that's basically, in a first order approximation, as we physicists say, how the silicon solar cell was born. By the introduction, sorry, by the discovery of its special properties. How about that silicon? Now, suppose these gray spheres are silicon atoms, then this is how silicon likes to sit. That's just what nature dictates. And that's how it gets its special properties. Now, how do you build a solar cell from this? Well, this little cube is actually a repeating unit, a unit cell. You can put one next to the other, you can put them on top of each other, you can build, that's how it works. So conceptually speaking, we can start with one unit cell, attach some others, build some other bricks, 
keep building, 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 and in the end, we put some electrodes on top and we have a solar cell. Of course, I did leave out some pretty crucial details here. This is not something you do on the kitchen counter. But um, yeah, that's how it works. Uh, silicon solar cells are a bit difficult. Silicon, you see, silicon needs to be ultra pure to unlock its desirable properties. And that means you need to treat it in a dust-free environment, wearing funky space suits and all. Yeah, that's what you need to do. So um, silicon needs to be 99.9999% pure to make good use of it for photovoltaics. So for every million of silicon atoms, there can only be one intruder, some kind of contamination. So if you would be the CEO of a company called Silicon Incorporated, very big company, one million employees, but there are two idiots working for you, bankrupt your company. That's how it goes with silicon. And then when the silicon is pure, then we need to purposefully add trace amounts of other metals in there again to make it conductive. And the associated processes with that are pretty high in temperature, up to 1400 degrees, 1400 degrees. That is more than the, the melting temperature of, of, of gold, silver, aluminum, typical metals, not all to make a product which has fairly little wiggle room in its properties and, and it's, uh, what it looks like. So that kind of makes us feel that there might be some room for improvement here or there. But silicon is only silicon. There is one type of atom. And I'm sure you're all very frustrated as a kid when you ended up with only one type of Lego bricks. There is only so many things you can make with one type, one type of Lego bricks. Indeed, I understand. And someone else who was very frustrated about this five years ago was Mike Lee. <coughs> Mike Lee was a graduate student in the research group of Professor Henry Snaith. They were also crazy Lego builders. And they were also looking for new building blocks for photovoltaics, for photovoltaic materials. And at some point, they came up with this. Mad scientist. <laughs> no, seriously, seriously, this is ingenious. This is a recipe for a wondrous material called perovskite. Perovskite. So, by the way, these are some of the uh, original first notes on the topic, and I have to thank both Dr. Lee and Professor Snate for sending these pictures to me to share with you today. So, perovskite, new material. You remember the, the repeating units of silicon? Well, Mike Lee discovered that you can pay, uh, make repeating units that look like this. If you just take the right elements, bring them together in, in, in the right conditions, but still using fairly basic chemistry. And he succeeded in making high-efficiency solar cells from these materials as well. That was five years ago. So how is the evolution until today? Well, let me show you a timeline of power conversion efficiencies of silicon solar cells versus perovskite. Silicon has been around for a long time, but perovskite is the fastest developing photovoltaic technology of all time. And it's quickly approaching silicon in terms of efficiency. So in that sense, it would be almost ready for commercialization. I mean, on such a short time scale, that is amazing. Or at least I think it's amazing. Uh, I see some faces now that say, well, Bert, I see your point, it's nice, but I don't really understand why you're making such a big fuss out of this. I'm glad you said so. So first of all, the perovskite that Mike Lee made consisted of these elements. But little stroll through literature learns us that there are many more possibilities. I probably missed some, I'm sure. So perovskite is not really the name of one material. It is the name of a family of materials that likes to structure itself in a certain structure that we call perovskite. But there are numerous possibilities to choose from to make that structure. And that that is the main advantage of perovskite over silicon, because if there's a lot of wiggle room, a lot of possibilities in uh, which elements you choose, then also uh, you can tune the properties to a very large extent. One of these properties that you can tune is color. Now, a very dark solar cell is always 
the, the most efficient one. Uh, silicon solar cells are also pretty dark, and we make uh, perovskites pretty dark as well. But color tuning does have its perks. The first one I want to discuss with you is fairly technical, so please bear with me. Solar cell is basically a layered structure with the good stuff in the middle, and then some other slightly less exciting but still very necessary things on the side. And I told you we can change the color of the perovskite. It's another way of saying we can change which part of the light it absorbs. So if we design two perovskites that either um, absorb another part of the light, we can make a solar cell like this and just stack them. We have a solar cell that absorbs more energy on the same area. Why does this work so well? Well, this is called a tandem solar cell. I'm pretty sure you've seen people on tandem bikes. They're not just necessarily overachievers, but they also go quite fast. That's because there are two engines on the bike, but it's just the same friction and drag as a normal bike, so they go faster. That's a tandem solar cell. And this is no piece of theory. In a recent work by the University of Oxford, Stanford, Washington, and ourselves, Hasselt University, we showed that this principle actually works. And in the future, we will we'll be able to stack even more layers, eventually to make solar cells that are twice the efficiency of the current silicon solar cells. So that was a technical part about color tuning. Of course, when you think about color tuning, first thing that comes to mind is aesthetics. In general, architects are not really wildly enthusiastic about uh, uh, solar cells or solar panels because, well, the look of a classical solar panel doesn't match the style of many buildings. But that can be a thing of the past with perovskites. We can even make them semi-transparent so they can be integrated into windows. And the ultimate art in all of this is called building integrated photovoltaics. I'll give you an example that you might recognize. This is a picture from Tesla, the company that is well known for its electric cars. And they announced that they were, would also commercialize photovoltaic roof tiles. So solar panels are still there, but unless we tell you, you probably won't notice. And that's what building integrated photovoltaics is all about. But with perovskites, we can take this to the extreme. Any possible surface that is available on, on a building could be a light harvesting surface. A whole building envelope could be one big solar cell. Instead of putting solar cells on the roof, we can integrate them as an actual part of the building and having it looking pretty at the same time. So you might wonder, well, not all buildings are the same. There are some tricky shapes there, uh, some tailored work. It must be very expensive as well. Those are valid concerns, but not to worry. Again, we can capitalize on the special properties of perovskite. You see, silicon was rigid and brittle, and you can make it only in relatively small pieces, so its production is like a batch process. But perovskite can be made in large areas, flexibly, and work in a continuous way. So it gets better. Perovskites don't need to be 99.9999% pure. They can have a smudge here and there, it doesn't really matter. So we can make them at room temperature or close to room temperature. And we can also do that with fairly simple techniques. In fact, I'm sure that most of you would be able to make a perovskite solar cell in the comfort of your own homes. Not in the kitchen, no. no not in the, in the shed, in the garden, no, but in your office space or wherever your printer is located. Because indeed, perovskite solar cells can be printed. They can be printed much like newspapers are printed, basically. Instead of having a, a roll of paper, you have a roll of plastic. Instead of having regular ink, you have a special perovskite ink. And with this resulting ribbon, you can just cut it to size, for the, the application that you want. You can even have bendy shapes, no problem at all. They're flexible anyway. It's this large piece. Next time your, uh, your grandmother's birthday is coming up, you buy her a photovoltaic tablecloth or something. <laughs> or something equally sexy. You can, you can buy her 
or for yourself, obviously. Um, you can buy a, a solar charger for your phone, you hold it into the sunlight, phone is charged, you roll it up and you're off. Or if you're on the move a lot, you can buy a bag with an active solar part to, to charge your, your tablet or your phone. If you like hiking, why not buy a tent with flexible perovskite solar cells worked into them? And while you're in the store anyway, you might as well buy the jacket. If you don't like hiking, you can get yourself uh, an artificial tree with, with uh, perovskite solar leaves. Why not? Or for those DIY people among us, we can buy photovoltaic tape. Uh, we can stick it wherever we need uh, instant power. So there can be perovskites in consumer electronics, bags, tents, boats, cars, planes, any, any type of construction, anywhere you want. It can be a whole photovoltaic perovskite landscape. So the sun is our most abundant renewable energy source. And now that scientists have proclaimed Eureka once more, the time is right to go all the way on solar with flexible, colorful, and high-performance perovskite. Thank you very much.